evaluation form to all his students. You would be able to do that? Yes, I will. Okay. Great. Um, so you can start now. Hello students and good morning. Welcome to day five of our Faculty of Medical Sciences orientation program. This morning on our program, we have a series of talks related to ethics and professionalism. So this morning, first up, we are going to have a feature from Dr. Avril Bethelmi. Dr. Bethelmi is a UE graduate who trained in both Trinidad and the United Kingdom. He is currently the convener for PEC. He will be talking a bit about ethics and professionalism, and then students will be breaking out into their individual Zoom sessions. All students who are in the MBBS program would be required to stay on this link and they would be able to view their session right here on this YouTube station. All other students would receive the link at the end of Dr. Batalmi's session in the chat. If you have received the link prior to this, then you can use that link and click into your separate sessions. I now hand over to Dr. Batalmi. Good morning, Dr. Batalmi, and welcome. Morning, Ms. Ramutasing. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, students. Um, I hope that you have enough energy on this day five of your orientation week to carry you through the orientation. I realize that you all must be exhausted and excited in equal measure. And that all you really want to do is go home and crack open those brand new textbooks and start reading. Some of you might want to put them in brown paper. Anyway, on behalf of the PEC program, I'd like to welcome you to the Faculty of Medical Sciences. And even though you must be tired, I would like you to try and give me your full attention just for the next 10 minutes or so. Now, historically, topics like professionalism and ethics and communication have always been regarded by medical students, well, all students of the Faculty of Medical Sciences as a soft subject compared to the glitz and the glamour of anatomy and physiology and biochemistry. But drawing on my experience as a medical professional of over 20 years duration, I can assure you that as you advance in your career, most of these glitzy subjects will be forgotten and you'll have to practice professionalism, ethics, and communication for the rest of your career. And as retirement age is currently 60 in this country, you can look forward to practicing these PEC principles for the next 40 years of your life, God willing. So as an example, the pharmacist among you will sometimes be asked to dispense drugs without a prescription. And it's made doubly hard, especially when you know the person's a neighbor or family member. Is this ethical? Is this professional? Optometrists and vets among you might be asked by pharmaceutical companies to promote medications that are untested, but the drug reps swear, doc, this is the best drug, the best thing since sliced bread. Dentists among you, a patient will, might present one day with a huge dental abscess and will eventually lead to airway blockage. And you tell the patient, well, you know, this abscess has to be drained and the patient looks at you and says, doc, I don't want any treatment, just leave it. What, as dentists, what are you supposed to do in this situation? Are you going to hold down the patient? Are you going to restrain the patient? Are you going to call the police to have them certified to take them to the hands and then you can do the operation? What is to be done in this case? Medics among you will be asked to tell patients that they have a serious illness or a terminal illness or that their loved one has just passed. What do you do? Do you just blurt it out and hope for the best? I'm 100% sure that there are people in the audience who have seen medical professionals dispense bad news to a family member and you just stood or sat quietly in a corner and you thought to yourself, something wrong here, this is not quite right, what he or she is saying, this is wrong. And as an, as an aside, the majority of medical complaints and legal cases stem from a lack of communication. So I don't want to see any one of you on the wrong end of a lawsuit in the future. At this point, I would like to emphasize, as if you didn't realize already, that you are no longer secondary school students, and the term culture shock was never more applicable than it is now. As students in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, you are all now professionals. And this applies whether you are a medical student, a dental student, an optometry student, a pharmacy student, or a vet student, you're all professionals. As soon as you put on that white coat, you will find that people will treat you very differently from before even people who have known you for years. 
your friends and your neighbors will come to you saying things like, my dog is ill, what's going on here? I have this lump on my back, they've had it for years, but because you're a medical student, they come into advice. I can't see, one eye is blurry, I have this pain in my mouth, is it, my, is it, a, is it an abscess, is it a toothache, is it a, a cavity? So all these things will be coming and asking you, even though you're still medical students and dental students and optometry pharmacy vet. Now in medieval and Elizabethan England, there were organizations called guilds. And these guilds were a collection of artisans and tradesmen whose purpose was really to regulate the quality of workmanship, the training of new members, and to provide support for their members. And there were guilds for virtually every trade from spectacle makers to armorers. And back then it was a mark of great prestige to belong to a guild, either as a full member or even as an apprentice. Once you were apprenticed to a guild, your social standing went up immeasurably. And much the same way as it is now very prestigious to be a professional. So I would like you to all think of yourselves from now as belonging to a guild. But even though being a professional attracts a certain amount of prestige, before you start congratulating yourself and slapping it on the back, I must tell you that in return, society expects certain things from you. As professionals, it behooves you to behave in a particular fashion, not just in your practice, but in public as well. This semester, Dr. Youssef, who you met yesterday and the tutors, will teach you about the social contract that you now have with society. And briefly, this is an, this is an unwritten contract that you have now entered into with society. In return for certain benefits that society grants you because of your professional status, you are now expected to behave in an altruistic, humanitarian and ethical manner. And even your behavior online needs to reflect your professional status. And this is something we'll explore more fully in semester two. So my point is that society does not owe you anything. Let me repeat that society does not owe you anything, but rather it is the other way around precisely because of your professional status. And for many years in this country, Trinidad and Tobago, this scenario has been the other way around so much so that the public perception of medical professionals is extremely low, and I'm sure you know that to yourself. As a guild, we are seen as greedy and grasping and only beholden to the almighty dollar, only interested in patients for what they could give us. So it is my sincerest hope that reversing this trend will start with this class. So I made brief mention of communicating with patients previously. And along with recognizing your commitments as professionals, communication is one of the skills that is most taken for granted, but is also one of the skills that is most difficult to acquire. And at this point, I can almost hear some of you thinking, well, how hard can it be to ask the patient some questions? But trust me when I tell you, it is not as easy as it seems. I've been a doctor for over 20 years and I still have my challenges when it comes to patients. Communication is not merely limited to asking the patient a history, it impacts hugely in other ways, including patient recovery, patient satisfaction, and yes, patient diagnosis and misdiagnosis as well. You'll have to take into account many variables when you're communicating with your patients, including race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and mental illness. And communication is not just limited to your patients, you'll have to learn how to communicate with your peers as well. And with the current pandemic kind of swirling around us, telemedicine will assume greater importance in the future. So at this point here in the lecture, um, before I leave, I would just like to give you two pieces of advice based on my experience as a medical student. The first is to temper your expectations somewhat. Many of you will be accustomed to achieving very high marks throughout your secondary school career but the volume of work that faces you now is unlike any that you have previously come across. I have personally seen a few of my colleagues have to take time off because of stress and mental illness in an effort to maintain those high standards. By all means, put your best foot forward, but give yourself a break if you get a B, C instead of an A. High marks don't necessarily translate to being a good doctor, a good dentist, a good optometrist, or a good pharmacist. And my second piece of advice is to talk to people and not to isolate yourself. And this is even more important during this period of social disengagement imposed by COVID-19. The course can be very stressful for some and everyone responds differently to pressure. If you find that you're not coping, don't be a hero. Talk to a friend, a family member, a mentor or a lecturer. 
And you'll be surprised to find out that you are not the only one in this boat. Okay, well, thanks very much for your attention. Any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions for you this morning, Dr. Bethelmy. Okay. So thank you very much for that talk, students, the importance of ethics again. In a short moment, we will be featuring Professor Harry Sitharaman. He will be addressing all MBBS students. And now I will be sharing with you the Zoom links in your chat. School of Dentistry, you are supposed to start your chat at 9.30 a.m. and that will finish at 10.20. School of Vet Students, you are to start at 10.20 and finish by 11. Optometry Students, you are to start at 10.20 and finish by 11. Nursing Students, you are to start by 11 and finish by 12. And Pharmacy Students, you are to start at 1 p.m and finish by two. So in a short moment, we will be sharing the Zoom links. Okay, now that for me, Jimmy. Students, please note that on the screen, you will be seeing your designated times. The links have been posted in the chat. Dental students, 9.30 to 10.20. Veterinary students, 10.20 to 11.10. Optometry students, 10.20 to 11.10. Nursing students, 11.10 to 12 noon. And pharmacy students from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. MBBS students, you are required to stay on this live stream to view your session with our next speaker, Professor Hari Sitaraman.
Okay, students, for all MBBS students who's, who are staying on this live, we have up next Prof. Hari Haran Sitharaman, who is going to give a talk about ethics and professionalism. Prof. Hari is the Secretary of the Medical Council of Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, Prof. Hari. Good morning, Rihanna. Thank you. And welcome to our orientation session this morning. I now hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, can I share the screen? Okay. Rihanna, you can see the screen, right? <clears throat> yes, Prof. Yes. Harry, we're seeing you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Medical students, um, you know, welcome to the faculty. I met with you on Tuesday um, regarding postgrad and specialization. And um, I'm again, uh, I've been asked to talk to you regarding the medical board, um, the medical board of Trinidad and Tobago, and the role of um, the medical board in regulating the medical practitioners. And uh, <clears throat> this is very, very important for you to know. And uh, as a as a doctor, you know, uh, what you are supposed to, you know, uh, do after you qualify and how you're supposed to register with the medical board and so on and so forth. So I am the current secretary of the medical board of Trinidad and Tobago. So I just wanted to give you a short presentation, like 20 minutes. Uh, I won't take much time, but um, I, in my view, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Bethlemy will would have talked to you about uh, the overall aspects of research. I, I mean, sorry, about um, ethics and professionalism, but I will um, I will focus on the, the medical board aspects of the same uh, paradigms, okay. Um, so what is medical board? Uh, the medical board is actually, um, is, is, a, is a constitutional body by, by an act of a parliament. Uh, it is a quasi judicial body, which is responsible for registration of all medical practitioners in the country and we, we also register uh, specialists we give them specialist certificate not as a qualification but uh, recognize them as specialists and um, and then we regulate the profession i can tell you a little more in detail about this medical board because you must know about it so um we have to be proud that you know in trinidad and tobago we are almost uh, two centuries old. I mean, uh, we had a, you know, um, bicentennial, bicentennial celebration in, uh, in, in 2015. So you can see that in 1814, um, they, they first uh, brought in this, uh, they created the medical board at that time, it was called the Proto Medicos. Um, so Governor Woodford by a proclamation said that you know, the Proto Medicos cannot give licenses in, in, in the Indies. In the Indies is the West Indies to any physician, surgeon, apothecary. Apothecary is a, is a guy, who, a druggist, or not, the, not in the derogatory sense, but uh, anybody who can, who dispenses a uh, drug. I mean, those days, I mean, they, they were called apothecary. Now we call them pharmacists, dispensing pharmacists. And uh, interestingly, barbers, barbers used to do a lot of um, surgical work. Uh, you know, cutting the abscesses and so, so on and so forth. So barber and also a veterinary practitioner, all of them came under this uh, Proto Medicos, which is medical board, which was 1814. And then they, they, it, 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 um, it, it proclaimed that, you know, unless they shall appear personally before them to be examined, we cannot license them. So we, for the past 200 years, we are still following the same thing. And that is why, you know, we, you will be asked to come and attend the medical board uh, after you pass your MBBS before we register you and give you license to practice. We ask you to come and appear before us and introduce yourself. We still follow this tradition for um, almost two centuries, right? So uh, the, the first medical board act of, uh, is an act of parliament, which uh, was actually passed in uh, 1960 and it has come into a lot, I mean, uh, I mean uh, so much transformation has been, I mean, amendments have been made to the medical board act. It was created to protect the public's interests and not the doctor's interests. So medical board is not a doctor's association. It is actually, a, uh, it is a, it's a board, it's a, a judicial body, uh, which is actually, um, you know, uh, which, is, which, which came into existence by an act of parliament to protect public interest. 
Okay, so the rules and the regulations stipulated in this act is what is governing us and all our functions at medical board. Now, medical board, when you when you when you become a doctor, a full licensed medical practitioner. So uh, when you when you pass your MBBS, you, we will give you a provisional license to uh, practice as an intern. You know, in that one year, when you finish your intern internship um, from UV, we give you a full registration. Okay, people who go into other medical schools, um, sometimes they may get a temporary registration depending on the college, but uh, you, uh, as so UV students, uh, you will get a full registration after completing uh, the internship. Now, when you become a member of the medical board, now you will be lifetime a member, but what we do is that, you know, we elect and we have an appointment of an executive council within the medical board. That is the medical council, which is an 11 member council, of which four are elected by, uh, elected by the medical practitioners, uh, the general membership of the medical board who are fully registered medical practitioners. So four doctors, um, then CMO is one, you know, which have chief medical officer is another doctor. And then there is one representing the University of West Indies. This is a doctor too. And there are two doctors appointed by the um, Minister of Health. So we have so many doctors in the medical, the 11 member council. After that, we have some non-medical people who are actually the uh, one from law association, one from chartered accountancy, one from uh, inter-religious organization. So uh, these, all these members constitute the 11 member council within the medical board. Now, we uh, meet every month to adjudicate, to um, see about uh, the doctors and the complaints and so on and so forth. So the, the overall aim is to protect the society from unscrupulous practices and to maintain acceptable international standards in regulating the doctors. So that is the function of the medical board. Now, the main function of the medical board is maintaining a register. You know, we do have a, a medical register to, to actually have a list of all the medical practitioners who are licensed to practice in the country. And then we do also have a medical specialist register where we actually uh, have the list of all the specialists in the country who are entitled to practice as a specialist. And according to that act, it is illegal to practice medicine. And you will be surprised there is one clause in the, in the medical board that nobody can call themselves a doctor even. So, uh, you know, people who, are, who call themselves to be a doctor without uh, registering in this particular uh, medical board, uh, you know, they are subject to be, you know, so, uh, you know, they are committing an offense against an act. So, but we don't, we don't, uh, we don't enforce it so um, rigidly, but without being entered into the register, they cannot practice medicine. And to maintain your membership, as I told you, when you become a, a fully registered medical practitioner, you become a member of the medical board, but to maintain your good standing, you have to pay an annual retention fee, which retains your membership and you will be in good standing. So the other areas where you cannot be, uh, you know, treated to be in good standing is when we have issues against the medical practitioner. So which we will go and that in that context, I'll have to tell you about the ethics and professionals. So the major roles of the medical board is we, as I told you, we um, uh, regularly, we meet uh, every month. We adjudicate on matters concerning medical practitioners. We get complaints and uh, either it can be something which is illegal activities of the medical practitioners or sometimes unethical and unprofessional behaviors and conduct of the medical, uh, prof uh, medical profession and medical practitioners. So in, 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 in summary, what we do is to ensure a safe healthcare delivery and also best practices. For example, if, if a, a patient complained to us that, uh, you know, this particular doctor did a procedure on me and uh, which, was, uh, which was not the current procedure and, and so we got some complications. So that will come to us. Either it can go to the court or it can come to us, depending on the, the, the nature, the, the gravity of that particular, uh, uh, you know, malpractice. So malpractice can be go, can go into the court. And if, they, if the doctor, the medical practitioner is indeed convicted of malpractice, then it will come to us. And then we will adjudicate whether the, the 
the medical practitioner can continue to practice in this particular uh, territory or whether he can be in, he or she can be in good standing and so on and so forth so those are the roles of the medical board now uh, this medical board act lists so many of the infamous and disgraceful conduct of a medical practitioner of a physician so i will give you some examples of this so to willfully betray the professional confidence okay so you are supposed to be a professional and uh, you know you cannot uh, you know definitely be deceptive that is one abandoning a patient you know you say that okay you have not paid a fee you have not done uh, you have not uh, compensated me i am not going to take care of you so that is actually an infamous and disgrace disgraceful conduct okay uh, knowingly giving a false certificate and i will i will go into the details in, in a case scenario i'm going to show you and that is very very important that you know you must mean you must take this, uh, this into consideration these are all are these are all these are unethical and unprofessional conducts so if you divide a fee and the profit with another person who is not a partner who is not a medical practitioner and so that is considered a disgraceful conduct if a medical practitioner gets addicted to excessive use of intoxicating liquor and uh, um, other substances that is a disgraceful conduct if the medical practitioner impersonates another doctor you go and sit in the clinic of another doc doctor and and just uh, sign on his prescription pad and and just say that you know i am that doctor so that is wrong indirectly or directly hold out to the public as a specialist without having a certificate from us uh, registered as a specialist if you do as a uh, practice as a specialist that is a disgraceful conduct and there is a, a, what we call as an omnibus clause which says that does anything unprofessional or discreditable to the profession uh, the medical board can take an action against the medical practitioner so these are actually listed in the medical board act and there are many of them and i just wanted to give you a little bit in the context of the ethics and professionalism right so what happens if if a, a medical practitioner is uh, is found to be uh, unethical or unprofessionalistic so the power of the council the, the the act gives the power to the council uh, depending on the gravity of the of the, the mistake committed or the offense committed either we can censure or reprimand give you a letter and put it on record that this doctor was reprimanded for so so reason and if the gravity is a little uh, further intense uh, we can suspend the doctor's license for a, a, a maximum of 2 years and then revisit the whole thing but if they if there is a major 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 issue then we can erase the name of the practitioner from the register and a uh, good news is that you know so far in the existence of uh, medical board over the 200 years we have only one uh, so far who have been erased from the register so i i mostly our, our medical practitioners are behaving good but i must say that you know there there are, there are a lot of other trivial or we can say trivial or i mean like complaints coming in which can be avoided further that's what i wanted to say now i just wanted to uh, in a, give you some case scenarios for you to understand the exact uh, you know what is an unethical and what is illegal behavior and all that stuff now uh, we got a complaint that a doctor issued a sick leave to an, a patient and when they checked the the, uh, the the this particular certificate went to another institution and when they checked the person on the on on whose name the certificate was given the patient was actually inside a prison so this doctor uh, you know gave a certificate without checking anything uh, just signed the certificate and then you know uh, okay some one one uh, gentleman got the certificate and then later on when they verified The, the he has given a certificate to somebody who is in prison that means he would have never seen the patient he would have just given it as a just for a, a sale which is extremely uh, not only unethical it is uh, illegal as i told you it is it is listed in the in the act that you know it is illegal now the the, the major thing is that you all have to understand that you are uh, when you prescribe medication it is a legal document so when you are walking you know in the, in the corridor you there somebody will come and tell you the, the hospital colleague somebody will come and say doc you know i i need this prescription can you write it over for me please don't do that because you are not examining a patient you are not prescribing a patient they will come and uh, give you some uh, some uh, medication you 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 cannot take responsibility for it 
and something happens, adverse reaction happens to happen to the patient, you will be held responsible. So please, please take this from the beginning of your entering into your medical uh, profession that prescriptions, sick leave, and anything what you sign are all legal documents and you have to be extremely careful about it. There can be uh, illegal as well as unethical uh, behavior con uh, concerned with these type of practices, okay? And actually we, uh, we actually asked that, uh, the doctor to come and then because he was extremely old or something like that, then we asked him to retire from the, from the profession anyway, but that is, that's a different thing. But if it is a young doctor who had been caught like this, there will be a, a repercussions for that. So there was another complaint to us that a male doctor examined a female patient alone in the consultation room. Okay, so the patient wrote a complaint to us that the doctor touched her inappropriately. And uh, there is no way to say, um, you know, the doctor will say, no, I didn't do that. And they, uh, the, the, the patient will say that, no, 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 he did that. So these are, these are things, behaviors, which is not in keeping with the professionalism of a medical practitioner. So when you have to do these things, you know, you have to have a chaperone uh, uh, or a, a nurse or somebody to be there. And, uh, you know, there is no need of uh, confidentiality in a, in a hospital setting, you know, so they, you can, because they are also bound by the clause of confidentiality, the nurse and nurses. So you can say that the nurse, you have to be here when I am examining this patient. So that will uh, that will actually and then you document everything and uh, that will be uh, that will be a be the best practice. So you have to maintain some sort of a professionalistic behavior. This is one example. I mean, I can go on and on and on for two hours, but I don't want to. I'm taking only twenty minutes. For, so I'm just giving you a, a, a little example of uh, what things can come to the medical council, right? Then this all these are real case scenarios. I'm not making anything. I'm not. Uh, doing any fictional things. A doctor wrote uh, really disparaging remarks about uh, the colleagues on the social media page. He attacked her with the, attacked the, with the people with uh, direct racial slurs. And I, I don't want to go into the details of this, but uh, one thing you have to know that as doctors, as society looks at you differently, you must maintain a decorum. You, you cannot uh, stoop down to the level of a, a common per person who, who wants to pick a fight and, and uh, in the street fights. And, and, and you, or you are beyond all these institutionals and caste and creed and, and uh, nationalities and everything. You, you see a patient as a patient and you have to be beyond all this. You are a scientist. You have to, you have to rise above all these uh, uh, you know, stupidities which are plaguing the society. So I do feel that, you know, you know, in this era of uh, social media, you have to be extremely careful about how you use it. And there are many, many other instances where actually they write about patients, they write about, uh, uh, um, you know, the behavior of patients and the patient attenders and so on and so forth. All this is, is very tempting to write, use the, medical, the, the social media page, but you have to be extremely careful as a doctor, you have to maintain the decorum. Okay, and then what is expected out of you? The society is expecting, you know, I, I, I'm so, I will be so uh, interested to uh, read the, the, the stuff you all write when you enter into the medical school. I want to be this, I want to be Dr. Patch Adams and, you know, I want to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, help the society and all that. But uh, over a period of time, you know, the, uh, things change. So, but I, what, uh, what I wanted to tell you is that in the society, expects even now in 2020 the, the medical profession doctor being a noble profession is a nobility associated with it so you have to know that you know money yes money is everybody needs money but money is not the only thing so when we charge uh, too much money to a, a, a patient they always common people think that you know uh, it's my, my out of my illness this man is building palatial houses and driving a mercedes benz and so on and so forth I'm not saying that your quality of life should be, you know, you, you have to live a poverty or Mahatma Gandhi's life and all that. I'm not saying that. But you have to strike a balance between what is charged and what you have to earn and how you earn the trust of, a, of the society, right? So I want to um, give you this particular uh, good medical practice is very, very important. This is directly taken from the General Medical Council of the United Kingdom, with which they have given a real good, uh, the gist of what is expected out of you. First thing, care of your patient is your first concern. Nothing else is a concern. 
when you are a medical doctor care your patient patient care is the top as a number one that is the first concern all other things money politics everything is secondary care of your patient then be comp competent you keep your professional knowledge up to date because i told you about the lifelong learning you have to do your cmes keep your professional uh, knowledge and that is how you can win the confidence and the trust okay and if patient safety is compromised in front of your eyes in any way take prompt action do not bother about the repercussions patient safety is the first thing okay um, there are a lot of questions will come with the with the pandemic situation and so on and so forth the ethical uh, the concerns but that's a different topic to discuss but i'm talking about in general when patient safety is compromised take prompt action maintain good partnership with the patients as well as colleagues do not you know there will be always we are all humans we will have differences of opinion always agree to disagree but maintain a good partnership with all the patients and colleagues and you maintain the trust being a very open uh, you know practitioner being honest and act with integrity so this is what is expected out of every medical practitioner okay and it is a real real uh, you know burden i i'll tell you that you know my medical profession is not easy and i am not again sounding ominous uh, you have a, a long way to go but uh, you have taken the right decision of getting into the medical profession but we all expect you that you know you maintain all the standards which we which is required out of you and and we welcome you again and uh, i can i can wait for you to answer uh, for for your questions and all the best wish you all the best welcome to fms again thank you Thank you, Prof. Harry, for that presentation. You enlightened us twice this week with your presentations. I'm sure that the student body were very grateful and appreciative of it. Students of the MBB session, this concludes your session for today. I want to thank each and every one of you for being part of our FMS orientation. It was quite a challenge this year with our new normal and going virtual. I do hope that you guys were enlightened by all our sessions. We welcome you once again to the faculty. One more announcement, please be advised that the Student Division Services would be in touch with you and emailing you a copy of the student evaluation form for your orientation sessions. It is a Google link that when you click on, you just answer questions pertaining to our sessions which session you enjoyed the most, which session, you know, give us your rating, let us know how it was. Uh, I did receive some emails from students pertaining to the Zoom links. I hope everyone has gotten through now for their respective session. We have just finished MBBS session. And I look forward to having you over at the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Thank you once again, and do keep safe.